Hi, everyone. So we'll be starting the webinar in just a few minutes. So I see folks are logging on. Um, so just for fun, you can answer a quick polling question just to see who's in the audience today and organization type that you're representing. So feel free to answer this for the next minute. All right, this is wonderful. So we're seeing a good amount of FQHC organizations on today's webinar. So definitely our target audience uh, along with the primary care associations. So thank you all for joining in as well as some um, government, academic, social service and other institutions. So always happy to have different audience types um, on this webinar. So I'm just gonna give it another few seconds. All right, so hello all and welcome to today's session. On behalf of the Special and Vulnerable Populations Task Force, we'd like to welcome everyone to the second webinar in our four-part national learning series focused on specific areas of the Diabetes Continuum of Care Framework, which is based on health center feedback from last year's 2019 series. As our title suggests, our second webinar today will discuss health literacy as one main strategy to improve prevention management and outcomes around diabetes. My name is Albert Eisen Jr. and I am the Senior Manager of Training and Technical Assistance at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APSHO for short, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. I'm also joined by my APSHO colleagues, Joe Lee and Christine Alarcon, as well as Jillian Hopewell from the Migrant Clinicians Network. The four of us combined serve as your front stage moderators and or backstage organizers for this entire learning series. So I welcome them today. Before we dive into our exciting content for the session, I'd like to go over our usual housekeeping reminders for Zoom. As an attendee on today's webinar, you'll be able to use certain features. First is audio. If you click the mute and unmute button, that will allow you to use your microphone. However, to minimize background noise during the presentation, all the attendees are muted upon entry. If you click the up arrow button on the right hand side next to the mute unmute, um, that allows you to also choose your specific audio settings for your microphone and speaker system, whether that's from your computer or from your phone. So feel free to explore that. Um, the next feature I wanna highlight is the Q&A feature. During the presentation, you may ask questions. Just simply click Q&A and type your questions into the free text field and the moderators, organizers, and guest speakers will either send a type response or will answer them during the live portion at the latter half of the session. You all as attendees can also upvote and comment on open questions if you wish. We do have an hour and a half together today, so I highly encourage you all to monitor the Q&A pod and virtually engage with each other this way. Uh, the next feature is chat. So by clicking chat, you can communicate with all the panelists and our attendees at any time during the session. So do chat us for your open-ended polling responses or for any of the technical troubleshooting issues with Zoom. Again, for the questions, we encourage you to, to use the Q&A feature and not the chat box. Uh, next is the raised hand and lower hand button feature. If you do have a question during the live Q&A portion towards the end, you can click the raise hand and the moderator, myself, will be able to open your audio for you to ask the question live. Afterwards, you can click the lower hand and that'll help dismiss your um, icon. If all else fails, just simply type your question in the Q&A pod and we'll go from there. Lastly, um, 
To leave the webinar, you just click the leave meeting um, button and you will be prompted to complete this post webinar survey. And your feedback is a huge important and will make a difference for us to provide higher quality training and technical assistance for future Nerdling series and events. So I encourage you all to take a minute or two to complete that once you leave. Um, and if you have to hop off early, that's A-OK. -okay. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and made available in our follow-up email to you all um, or on diabetes.apsha.org. And for those of you who want to review the slides, um, my colleague Christine has made the slide handout available on our website, which you'll find in the chat box. So you can click there if you want to go ahead and download that on your end. All right, so just a brief note about this series. If you were able to join us last week, I'm sorry for the redundancy. And for those of you who are new, uh, this national learning series was created to address our nation's diabetes epidemic, which is affecting more than 30 million people across the US today. According to the 2018 UDS or Uniform Data System, uh, diabetes poses a unique challenge for the HRSA Health Center program because one in seven health center patients has diabetes and nearly one in three of those patients have uncontrolled diabetes. So to combat and continue the national conversation around diabetes, the Special and Vulnerable Populations Task Force has collaborated on this learning series to increase your knowledge of effective strategies that prevent, treat, and manage diabetes among health center patients. We'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge HRSA um, in their support of this task force and its efforts to decrease the percentage of health center program patients with hemoglobin A1Cs greater than nine. And just a quick uh, overview of the Special and Vulnerable Populations Diabetes Task Force. It's represented by 14 National Cooperative Agreement or NCA organizations that are all funded by HRSA and we're all dedicated to improving the health of special and vulnerable populations served at health centers. These 14 NCA organizations have partnered for the past three years to create meaningful content and provide access to expert guest speakers for you today, our audience. So for more information about all the NCA partners, you can Again, visit diabetes.apsha.org and you'll find hyperlinks to all 14 organizations. All right, so just to acknowledge the environment we're in, um, the task force has been very adamant about integrating content around COVID-19 or coronavirus, um, especially since health centers are impacted heavily on a day-to-day -day with their operations and workflows. So the task force wants to acknowledge, again, COVID-19 and its pandemic and the healthcare environment that's constantly changing. And we wanna thank all of the frontline staff and healthcare providers during this time. As you know, health centers and the workforce play a vital role in the national response to COVID-19, in part by making patients aware of the virus and communicating preventative measures to determine if patients need COVID-19 screening and testing. Health centers are also coordinating with their state and local health agencies as part of the emergency management and response plans. So by continuing to provide primary care and telehealth to your patients, health centers can relieve the congestion in the hospital ICU and emergency department rooms that are becoming crowded with patients seeking care for severe and critical COVID-19 infections. We want to tell it all health centers know that our 20 NCA organizations are currently and continuously compiling COVID-19 resources through our Health Center Resource Clearinghouse, which is available at healthcenterinfo.org. And that's, um, again, healthcenter.info.org. Um, I can have my colleague, Christine, again, type in that link if you all wanna bookmark that on your end. Um, in relation to this webinar, there is a clear connection between COVID-19 and diabetes. People with diabetes, again, according to the ADA, are not more likely to get COVID-19 than the general population. However, people with underlying chronic medical conditions like heart, lung disease, or diabetes seem to be at higher risk for developing more serious symptoms and complications when infected with the coronavirus. If one's diabetes is well managed, the risk of getting severely sick from COVID-19 is about the same as the general population. So again, encourage you all to check out some of the resources available from the ADA or American Diabetes Association, the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, the CDC, and Jocelyn Diabetes. And I'm well aware that all the NCA organizations are 
providing resources and information on their own websites as well. So you can access each of the NCA's organization websites again through diabetes.apsha.org for shortcut. All right, so now it's my pleasure to introduce and pass the mic on over to today's speakers who represent three different NCA organizations. And I'm gonna start from left to right here. First, we have Ariel Mather, Ariel serves as a program manager at the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders, overseeing the planning and delivery of the center's training and technical assistance activities. She has spent many years in the Boston nonprofit sector addressing the needs of older and vulnerable populations, as well as the providers who care for them. Ariel received her MPH or Master's in Public Health from Tufts University School of Medicine, where she concentrated in health communication. So we look forward to her expertise on health literacy today. Next, we have Rebecca Young, or Becca. She is the Senior Project Manager at Farmworker Justice in Washington, DC. Becca has been at Farmworker Justice for nine years and currently um, helps with their health promotion team. Rebecca has had the opportunity to engage with farm worker communities across the US and finds continued inspiration from her work through the stories of farm workers and their families who are willingly able to share. Becca holds an MA in Sustainable Development and Social Justice from the School of International Training, as well as a BA in Anthropology and English from Bowdoin College. Lastly, we have Cindy Selmy. Cindy joined Health Outreach Partners as Executive Director in November 2019, bringing over 30 years of health center and nonprofit leadership experience. Prior to HOP, Cindy worked for Plant Parenthood Northern California and most recently as Senior Regional Director for Contra Costa and San Francisco Health Centers. Cindy has a bachelor's degree from the University of California at Santa Cruz in biology, and she started her health center career volunteering for the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, which fueled her dedication to health equity and ensuring, ensuring access to health care for all. So it gives me with great pleasure to pass it over to Ariel um, to kick off the content. Thank you so much, Albert, and thank you everyone who was able to join us live on the webinar today as, the, as well as those who are listening in later. Uh, as Albert said, my name is Ariel, uh, and we're going to have a few different speakers throughout this session today, but I'm happy to kick it off. You'll see the learning objectives on the slide. Uh, we're hoping that you'll be able to walk away from this session being able to explain the importance of health literacy for successful self-management of chronic conditions. We also hope you'll be able to describe the impact that low health literacy has on diabetes prevention and outcomes among patients from special and vulnerable populations. We also hope you'll be able to develop practical strategies to communicate health information and help patients build health literacy skills over time. Next slide. We also are going to be able to hear from some fantastic panelists today. Um, we have two panelists who you'll hear a little bit more about towards the end of uh, our time together, but I'll briefly mention that we've been able to gather the perspective from Tammy uh, Leung, who's the Shared Savings Program Coordinator from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as well as having live with us today, uh, Mari Dolores Valentin, who's the director of the Ag Worker Health Program at the Beaufort Jasper Hampton Comprehensive Health Services. So we're excited to hear from their perspectives. Next slide. And you heard a little bit about a few of us and seeing our pictures who are actually going to be speaking on the session today, but certainly this was, this presentation was a group effort between these three NCAs that you see on the slide. Want to give an extra shout out to Alexis Guild and Bellany Reese, who were also fantastic team members as we put together this content for you today. Next slide. All right, so as Albert mentioned, this is the second session in this learning series, but it's the first of two webinars that are focused specifically on increasing health literacy to improve diabetes outcomes. So today we're gonna to be focusing on understanding health literacy. So we're gonna start at the very beginning with defining what health literacy is. If you do a quick Google search on health literacy, we'll lead you to several government and healthcare organizational websites that all point to a version of the definition you see on the screen now. This one was laid out in the Affordable Care Act of 2010. 
This gives us the framework that health literacy involves a person's capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand health information and services, and then use that to make decisions related to their health. The term capacity is referring to the potential for someone to do something or accomplish something. This applies both to patients making health decisions and the providers and staff delivering health information to them. Today, we're gonna to primarily be talking about how health literacy impacts patients, particularly from special and vulnerable populations. Go to the next slide. So we wanted to include a few more definitions here to help highlight how much the field has evolved over time in its understanding of health literacy. So yes, it involves understanding health information um, and those reading, uh, listening, analytical skills, but it also requires applying it to real life decisions. This can include the ability to understand instructions for prescriptions, appointment slips, brochures, directions from providers, or even signing consent forms. And our healthcare system is certainly complex and more recent health literacy definitions include the ability to navigate that, that system. Next slide. When we're thinking about language, it's really important that health messages are being delivered in a language that the patient fully understands. Translation and inter interpretation services are helpful, but can sometimes be problematic or insufficient. For example, not all words and or concepts translate directly from one language to another. Patients may have weak literacy or numeracy skills in their native language, and communication may be too technical. Additionally, the context of communication matters. So when we're thinking about cultural context, for example. So in summary, the intended meaning may be lost, causing confusion even when everyone involved in the communication exchange believes they understand what is being said. Next slide. Um, so we have a case story to share with you today that illustrates some of the challenges around health literacy from the perspective of the patient. Um, I'll read aloud the case study and then we'll have a short series of questions to ask you. So Roberto is a mom speaking farm worker from Guatemala. He's in his late 60s and works in the strawberry fields of Santa Maria, California. Although he is able to communicate in very basic Spanish, he is much more comfortable in his native language. He lives with his daughter and son in law, also both mom speakers, and his young granddaughter who has learned Spanish through her peers in school. At a recent appointment, Roberto learned that he has diabetes. He'd been losing weight and experiencing a lot of thirst at night for the past several months. He remembered his father had experienced these same symptoms at about his age, was diagnosed with diabetes, but then passed away from complications several years later. Because of his father's untimely death, Roberto has been scared to go to the clinic. However, his daughter convinced him to go. At the clinic, Roberto had the help of a Spanish interpreter but unfortunately, there wasn't anyone available who spoke mom. His daughter came into the room to try to help as well when he was being given his treatment directions, but struggled to understand the specifics. The doctor was behind in his schedule and only made a cursory check to ensure that Roberto knew the steps he needed to take. At one point, the doctor asked Roberto if he had any questions. Roberto glanced away and then asked his daughter to explain that he would look at the materials at home. However, when Roberto and his daughter arrived home, they felt unsure about how to handle the diabetes diagnosis. Next slide. Right. Um, so now we'll ask you the first question, um, which is why do you think Roberto didn't ask more questions about his diagnosis and treatment plan? Um, and if you can take a moment or two to type your responses into the chat box, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, so this is great. We're getting lots of responses already. So some ideas out there from you guys are embarrassment, fear, 
language bar barriers. Um, um, it was too rushed, so he wasn't able to ask questions. Um, and also he felt the burden perhaps of having others um, translate or interpret on his behalf. Um, great, so those are some really good examples. Um, so we can go ahead and, and move along to the next slide with the second question. And that is, what are clues that Roberto does not understand what the clinician is telling him? So again, please go ahead and take a moment and type your responses into that chat box. Yep, so some ideas are he looked away or he was looking at his daughter. Again, fear um, that he was experiencing. Um, he wasn't able to ask for clarification. Um, he glanced away um, from the doctor. Um, he doesn't understand Spanish well. Uh, he feels overwhelmed and he wasn't asking any questions for, for um, clarification. So those are all those are all great responses. Thanks. We can move along to the, the third and final question. Um, so what clinical support and community resources would be helpful for patients like Roberto? Again, you can go ahead and type your responses in. So some ideas are having an interpreter, having a navigator or promotora that could help in this case, um, setting them up with case management. Um, again, that idea of a care coordinator, um, also potentially that use of language lines. So that might be a way to be able to help um, with a mom, which is, a, um, which is a, a more challenging language to get interpretation sometimes um, than Spanish. Um, also an idea of to schedule a follow-up appointment um, for education with the appropriate interpreter. So yeah, so those are all really great ideas. Um, and just to go back to that idea of, of having a community health worker or promotora or health navigator. Um, and so when, when we have um, those in clinic settings, they can be a great asset to patients since they often share the same language and cultural backgrounds as the patients. Um, and additionally, just to conclude, it's important to have specialized interpretive services such as mom set up ahead of the visit, if at all possible. Um, thanks everyone for sharing all of your ideas about the challenges faced by patients like Roberto. Next slide. Great, thank you, Becca. And thank you so much to everyone who's been giving their feedback in the chat box. I love um, a, a group that's really involved in this discussion and I, I encourage you to continue sharing your thoughts as we go along. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of low health literacy for you know someone like Roberto or anyone with low levels of health literacy. We know there could be a significant impact both clinically and in the everyday life of a patient. There's a higher likelihood of a patient not fully understanding their diagnosis if they have low levels of health literacy, which would also make it harder to follow a provider's instructions or directions on a prescription, perhaps. Uh, if someone doesn't understand the risk of developing a condition or ways to prevent a condition from worsening, they will likely not be aware of or seek out preventive care. Because of all of this, uh, low levels of health literacy could impact the rates at which people experience complications or poor health outcomes, particularly for those with one or more chronic conditions. Low health literacy can cause interruptions in the continuum of care, which means a provider may not be able to effectively track a patient's needs over time and provide comprehensive services. Instead, complications often lead to the usage of more urgent or emergency care services, which are very expensive and may not have consistent follow-up. Can we go to the next slide? 
So we know that health literacy is important for making good decisions about our health, but what could get in the way of developing or improving a patient's health literacy? We saw some examples in our case study with Roberto just a few moments ago, and we've listed some examples here. Again, certainly encourage you to share other ideas in the chat if you think of any. I'll talk a little bit more later on about this idea of confidence or self-efficacy, the way someone feels about their own ability to make or sustain a change related to their health. If that confidence is low, probably not a whole lot is actually going to change. Some of you may be very familiar with different learning styles. If you take a second to reflect on uh, the way you personally best understand presented information, uh, maybe you like to read it. Maybe you like to listen to someone else tell you the information. Perhaps you learn best in a group setting or using a combination of multiple learning styles. If health information is only presented in one way, particularly just in writing, it may limit someone's ability to really absorb and make decisions based on that limited delivery method. When it comes to cultural differences, uh, Becca mentioned earlier that while translation or interpretation are certainly necessary, they're not always a complete solution to bridging differences. If a provider or staff member is not aware of all cultural differences or how they might influence health behavior, health messages may not completely be understood or acted upon. And of course, there are, can be significant barriers to improving, improving health literacy present with a lack of time or follow-up with a patient. Without enough time for questions, especially if a patient is unsure of even how to ask a question, important details may be missed or not fully understood. And even in an ideal situation where a patient does understand instructions during a visit, a lack of follow-up may result in missed opportunities to address challenges in changing or sustaining a behavior or provide needed motivation or support to continue with a behavior over time. Next slide. Now, while anyone could experience low levels of health literacy for a variety of reasons, there are specific population factors that indi indicate a higher likelihood of having lower health literacy rates, which we have listed on their slide. Age can be a factor regardless of any other cultural differences, particularly for those over the age of 65. And according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, 65% out of nearly the 77 million Americans who struggle with health-related reading tasks are from minority populations. For refugees or immigrants, there may be lower levels of health literacy around the healthcare system of, of their host country or a variety of social or demographic factors as they are not all the same. The level of education a person has completed can be a factor in developing adequate levels of health literacy as well as their socioeconomic status. We're noting at the bottom of this slide that, um, sorry, lost it, uh, that members of the special and vulnerable populations that our larger task force focuses on as a group of national cooperative agreements are often part of one or perhaps more of these groups listed above. So we are particularly invested in better understanding their health literacy barriers and needs. Next slide. Now, while we've talked more generally about health literacy and its impact, we're now going to start shifting our focus more specifically to the role of health literacy in diabetes control and prevention for these special and vulnerable populations. As mentioned previously, lower levels of health literacy are going to impact a patient's understanding of their condition and treatment. So a patient may not fully understand the why behind the details of their diabetes treatment. Some of the health behaviors needed for diabetes management, like healthy eating and medication adherence, could be dependent on a patient's or perhaps a caregiver's ability to read food labels or interpret blood glucose test results. Good health literacy skills can be empowering for a patient, allowing them to better identify when they have a question or a gap in understanding 
and to feel more confident in the areas where they have the necessary knowledge to effectively manage their condition. The NCA faculty on the call today have a specific focus on both agricultural workers and older adults, so we will be highlighting some special considerations for the health of these populations. Next slide. Great, so this slide highlights data from the 2016 National Agricultural Workers Survey, which we call NAS. And this is a survey of U.S. crop workers that's conducted by the U.S. Department of Labor. Collecting data on farm workers tends to be difficult, so we rely heavily on this NAS data, but realize that it might not represent a complete picture. Here are some of the major factors that are important to bear in mind as we think about health literacy for farm workers. Um, so about 76% are foreign born, with Spanish being the dominant language. That being said, there's a growing population of indigenous farm workers as well. So we see the necessity of interpretive services, as we talked about earlier in the case study of, of Roberto, and the need for culturally and linguistically appropriate materials. Often, farm workers are traveling alone without a support network such as family and living in remote locations. When farm workers are, are able to visit a clinic, about 63% of migrant and seasonal agricultural workers report having no health insurance. And so while they can be seen in federally qualified health centers, they aren't always able to access more specialized or follow-up care. There's also a high burden of chronic illness, uh, such as diabetes, hypertension, asthma, to name just a few. Um, so these are some of the special considerations to think about when we are discussing health literacy and farm workers. Next slide, please. Great, so when we're talking about special considerations generally for older adults, again, when we talk about older adults, we're referring to individuals over the age of 65. While they might be close in age, this is a very diverse group and their health could be influenced by many different factors. We do know that older adults generally have high rates of chronic conditions with a significant portion living with at least two or more. In spite of health challenges, this is a population that is living longer and is significantly growing over time. You may have seen census projections for the coming decades moving from a pyramid to a pillar with U.S. older adults um, projected to outnumber children for the first time by the year 2034. This really highlights the need for care that takes into consideration the unique needs of individuals as they age, which could include physical factors like impacted vision, hearing, or mobility. Additionally, cognitive factors such as short-term memory challenges or being easily distracted could also play a role in how health information needs to be relayed. While some older adults are certainly able to continue their medical appointments independently, others may need the support of a formal or informal caregiver, often a member of their family, to assist with their care plan, meaning there may be multiple people in the room to communicate health information to. Next slide. There is a real need for health literacy and diabetes education and prevention because this leads to more patients utilizing preventive healthcare services. Preventive education is also correlated with a better understanding of health education in general, and ultimately it makes patients more likely to engage in health promoting behaviors. Next slide, please. We don't have accurate data on the rate of diabetes among ag workers. Some estimates say between six and 8%, but we actually believe the rate to be much higher than that. Indigenous communities tend to have a higher prevalence of diabetes than other communities. And there is an increasing number of workers from indigenous communities in Mexico and Guatemala. There are many contributing factors like stress. Um, so job security and immigration status exacerbate levels of stress. Challenging working conditions lead to difficulties in preventing and managing diabetes. The issue of mobility is important as well in thinking about migrant farm workers, especially because it's difficult to ensure continuity of care for diabetes patients as they travel between crops, often to different states, all within the course of a calendar year. Food insecurity is also a huge issue when it comes to diabetes prevention and management. 
for farm workers. Um, this is particularly ironic um, given the fact that they're the ones who harvest the fruits and vegetables, yet they don't they often don't have access to those same foods. They make very low wages generally, so often they are unable to afford them. They may not have pr proper or sufficient refrigeration and food storage facilities where they're living. And due to remote locations and lack of transportation, they aren't always able to access larger supermarkets with more affordable fresh produce. Cultural beliefs, for example, fatalism, also play a role in workers believing that their actions might not influence their health outcomes in a positive way. Um, to mitigate these factors, it's important that diabetes information and plans are tailored to incorporate the beliefs and everyday re realities of agricultural worker patients. Next slide, please. Great. So we can look at some quick facts for older adults and how health, their health literacy levels may impact their diabetes management. We mentioned earlier that many adults over the age of 65 do have two or more chronic conditions, one of which could be diabetes. There's a large portion of older adults who have pre-diabetes, meaning that they are at a critical point of needing to implement lifestyle changes like diet or exercise to avoid developing type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, many older adults may be experiencing depressive symptoms or depression uh, that are not appropriately recognized by their provider, who may be attributing signs of depression to another condition, or maybe even mistakenly believing it's a normal part of aging. Depression and diabetes can complicate each other, as depression could impact a person's motivation to engage in healthy behaviors, and diabetes management can often be stressful or cause complications that could make depression worse. Even if an older adult has always been good at taking their medications consistently, as they age, those medications may metabolize differently or cause different degrees of side effects. And while much of our diabetes management goals focus on avoiding high blood sugar or hyperglycemia, older adults are particularly at risk for being affected by hypoglycemia or low blood sugar as a result of overtreatment or inadequate nutrition and this can be very dangerous. This is a population that certainly benefits from simplified diabetes management tasks with extra support given around making changes to a treatment plan that's familiar to them. For those with concerns around cognitive dis dysfunction, this is where hopefully there is a caregiver or a family member to involve in treatment planning to ensure regimens are understood and are manageable. Next slide. So what is really exciting about improving health literacy is that every member of a healthcare team can play a part. So a team-based approach can take health literacy theory and put it into action, helping to close communication gaps and consider best practices in relaying information to, to patients. The next health literacy session, part two of sorts, uh, happening in one week on April 7th, We'll focus more on the service delivery approaches to improving health literacy, including how the various roles on the healthcare team can help meet the needs of patients as they navigate the system. But we do just want to give some brief thoughts around the team-based approach, which includes defining a clear process for assessing health literacy needs and a clear understanding for all about what comes next once a need has been identified. There are many health literacy assessments out there, which again will be covered in more detail during next week's session. It is important that the whole healthcare team understands some of the special considerations we've covered so far in this presentation, that there could be a variety of conditions or circumstances that influence or limit the level of health literacy skills an individual patient has. If the team is equipped with diverse resources and services that can help address low health literacy, whether those be within the health center or within the community, providers and staff can have these in mind before, during, and after patient conversations related to their understanding of health information and services and be ready to share. And finally, self-care behaviors are essential for diabetes management and each member of the team can help to encourage and support patients as they work towards their goals 
or implement new lifestyle changes. Next slide. All right, so we just talked briefly about the idea of anticipating instances where a patient might have difficulty understanding health information, perhaps for a particularly complicated regimen or something that's completely new to them, and then preparing resources or extra support accordingly. But we can take this a step further by applying a universal precautions framework for addressing health literacy concerns. This is really assuming that everyone might have a hard time understanding information or accessing services. Going into all patient conversations with this assumption is helpful for everyone, even for those with high levels of health literacy. Taking universal precautions applies to both the conversations we have with patients and the way we structure the office environment or even the larger health system that they're navigating. If there's too much or too complex health information for a patient to take in or understand, they may feel anxious or overwhelmed, ultimately not supported in their efforts to improve their health. Since we may not have the time or the ability to know what might be impacting a patient's ability to understand complex health information during an appointment, taking a universal precaution approach helps to support as many patients as possible. Next slide. All right, so now we're gonna go over some strategies to increase health literacy. And again, we'd love to hear um, if you can think of any others that you would like to discuss during the Q&A at the close of our session. These strategies include clear communication, plain language, checking for understanding, positive messaging, and goal setting. Next slide. All right. Yes, thank you. We have a couple of animations here. Um, so we briefly mentioned different styles of learning earlier in this presentation. Certainly there are a few ways that we can communicate with patients. The primary two ways being written information and direct conversation. So when you hear the term clear communication, what comes to mind for you? In writing, that could look like using short sentences that get straight to the point putting thoughts in bullet form like we've done on this very simple slide uh, can help to keep things organized along with making sure there's enough room between ideas or instructions certainly okay if there's white space uh, pictures can be a helpful tool um, if they're easy to understand i saw a few people mention during the, the case study of maybe infographics might have helped with roberto um, if they can bring instructions to life, that can be really helpful. Uh, when speaking directly to a patient, being mindful of the pace is especially important. Uh, many of us, including myself, have the tendency to speak more quickly when there's a lot to get through or there are other things on our minds. Uh, repeating the most important pieces of information can also help things to stick particularly if you are wrapping up a more detailed explanation of a treatment regimen. And while it's helpful to be responsive to questions when they come up, it can be even more effective to encourage questions directly, letting patients know that it is normal to have questions and concerns can hopefully allow them to feel more comfortable letting you know when something doesn't make sense or if they're feeling unsure about their next steps. Next slide. So it's really important to use plain language to increase health literacy. Plain language is writing designed to ensure the reader understands as quickly, easily, and completely as possible. It strives to be easy to read, understand, and use. Written material is in plain language if your audience can find what they need, use what they find, and use what they find to meet their needs. Next slide, please. So these are two examples that illustrate the concept of plain language. The first example on your left is part of a diabetes toolkit developed by Vanderbilt. It uses simple, clear instructions such as be active, take your diabetes medication every day, and clean and look at your feet every day. These clear and direct messages are accompanied by simple illustrations. The image on the right draws your eye in with the bright colors and easy to follow illustrations. 
such as the arrow leading to a food label and a dialogue presented about eating chips. At Farmworker Justice, we received positive feedback from community health workers at clinics and farmworker-based organizations about the brochure. This was published as part of our HRSA National Cooperative Agreement in May of 2019. These two materials demonstrate how written materials should be developed in plain language. Next slide. At Farmworker Justice, in our trainings with community health workers, we use the teach back method to help with comprehension and retention of information. For example, in our Juntos project, which is focused on childhood obesity prevention, we first lead the community health workers or promotoras through a series of interactive activities as we build content. The last area of our training focuses on having the community health workers work in small groups to practice presenting the information back to their community members. Through this process, they are always asking questions of one another and the group, and this helps them to both process and retain the information. Next slide, please. Positive messaging, um, this is so important. Using positive messaging helps to dispel fear and increase potential for seeking testing or treatment. Positive messaging empowers patients to prevent and manage their diabetes. It encourages patients to learn about diabetes and talk about it with others and com combat stigma around diabetes. Next slide, please. Um, so this brochure, which is called Life of the Party, is a great example of positive messaging. Through conversations with farm workers and community health workers in clinics and farm worker based organizations, we'd heard a lot about the fright that accompanies the diabetes diagnosis. The diabetes diagnosis was seen as a very negative diagnosis, which basically meant a death sentence. We wanted to create something that would help to empower workers with diabetes demonstrate how diabetes does not mean you need to be ashamed and give them some solid tools for helping to control their diabetes through healthy nutritional practices. Even the title itself sounds very positive and sounds much more welcoming. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, encouraging patients to set self-management goals for their diabetes. There are some fantastic community-based self-management programs, both for diabetes, as well as some who focus on a little bit more um, chronic diseases more generally. Um, if you haven't already heard about them or you're not familiar with them, uh, they're typically offered both in English and Spanish and led by certified trainers, often who are individuals living with the same condition and can offer that peer support. Um, I do know that COVID-19 is certainly changing the way that we currently meet together, especially with these community programs, though I do know um, of some that are trying to have these uh, weekly workshops in a virtual setting, but that's going to depend on, uh, on where you live, if that will be available for your patients. Um, we don't have enough time today to discuss all the benefits of these programs, but I would encourage you to look up any available programming in your community to refer your patients to, not as a replacement for other programs or treatment, but as an additional resource. A foundational element of these weekly workshops uh, is goal setting through a personalized individual action plan. This approach is one that health center staff and providers can also incorporate into conversations with their patients taking a larger goal for their health long-term and breaking it down into more manageable steps. The key to making these goals realistic is to really get into the details, helping a patient understand and to figure out for them what lifestyle change they'd like to try uh, just this week, uh, not really over the next month, not really longer, just a short-term uh, week-based goal and then kind of exploring uh, how much, when, how often, the answers to these questions are going to depend on the type of behavior um, they're choosing and how often it typically needs to be done or tried. Uh, but after you've gone through these questions with the patient and they've laid out a weekly action plan for themselves, it can also be helpful to have them reflect on how confident they are that they can accomplish this in the next week. So using a scale from one to 10 can be an easy way to mark this. 
if a patient's reporting uh, below a six or so on that scale, um, 10 being highest uh, level of confidence, it might be a good indication that the goal doesn't feel quite achievable enough and maybe some adjustments can be made so they can at least feel moderately confident going into that task. Next slide. Many of you are likely very familiar with the approach of motivational interviewing, which can help a client, in this case being a patient, uh, when there is hesitation or mixed feelings around making a change. There are some basic communication techniques from this framework that I think fit really nicely into this conversation about goal setting with the patient, particularly if they are not feeling very confident that they can make a lifestyle change. These techniques can be summarized with the acronym ORS, which I think gives a really nice visual, you know, ORS on a boat, helping it to move forward, moving from point A to point B. The first technique is using open-ended questions, which is, of course, a helpful approach when having conversations generally with patients, as it will help to provide more context about their concerns and not just give a straight answer in a yes or no format. Those questions would typically start with words like what, how, or even something like tell me about blank. Uh, next, we focus on affirming language, which can be used uh, to praise positive behaviors that you can already see the patient engaging in or offering support to them as they explain the challenges they could be experiencing. That encouragement and empathy can go a long way in building a relationship and helping them to build confidence for making changes going forward. R in ORS stands for reflective listening, and this can be harder than it sounds, especially when we're thinking about what we need to say next to a patient. This is a process of checking in to see what was meant instead of assuming we know what was meant. Uh, and we can do that by either directly repeating, paraphrasing, or even reflecting back the feelings that a patient is expressing. An easy way to do this could be leading off with what I'm hearing you say is blank, or even following up with a simple, does that sound right? And then allowing the patient to respond. Now we don't have enough time today to dive into all the potential communication roadblocks when it comes to encouraging someone to change their behavior, but actively listening and checking in for understanding goes a long way. And finally, summaries are a, a special form of reflective listening that can be used at the start or end of a visit during any sort of transition from one topic to the other. Uh, this gives you the opportunity to review important aspects of your conversation, still checking in to see if the patient's on the same page. A summary can be a mix of, here's what we've gone over today about your diabetes treatment, and here's what I've heard you tell me today about your situation. And then of course, allowing the patient to respond. Next slide. So the last thing I'd like to mention before we transition over to our panel is the concept of self-efficacy as it relates to health literacy and diabetes management. We have a definition listed here on the slide that it is the belief in one's ability to succeed particularly to complete a task or address a challenge. As we've seen from discussing the impact of low health literacy and the health literacy that's needed to effectively manage diabetes, there are certainly plenty of tasks or challenges that your patients may be facing. Self-efficacy really focuses on the belief here, actually regardless of whether they've accomplished a particular task before. And this really does impact the likelihood of a person starting and maintaining a behavior change. In this case, about making lifestyle changes or sticking with a treatment regimen. If someone really believes they can succeed, it is because they also believe they have the tools and support they need to address any challenges they may encounter along the way. The relationships that you build with patients as your health center team identifies their concerns increases their understanding of their condition and their treatment options, and offer resources for making changes to improve their health will allow that confidence to grow. Next slide. Thank you, Arielle. Um, 
I'm Cindy Selmy, and I'm here to introduce our panelists. I want to thank them for participating today in our webinar. And first, I would like to introduce Tammy Leong. Tammy is currently an Accountable Care Organization Coordinator at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the San Francisco office. She is also a U.S. Public Health Service Commissioned Corps Officer who has worked with the Indian Health Service for six years. She worked in Tuba City, Arizona and Taos, New Mexico for three years each serving the Navajo and Taos Pueblo tribes respectively. As a certified diabetes educator, she assessed the needs for patients with diabetes and provided comprehensive clinical care prior to joining the U.S. Public Health Service. She worked as a pharmacist in the U.S. Air Force for eight years. She currently volunteers weekly at the South of Market Health Center in San Francisco on various diabetes projects. Um, I'm sad to say that Tammy was not able to join us um, live today as in her role, she was called upon to serve at the California Office of Emergency Services. The Emergency Operations Center needed her as part of the COVID crisis that we are currently experiencing. But Tammy has um, given us lots of information for our panel questions. Second, I would like to introduce Mari Dolores Valentin. Mari was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. She graduated from the University of Puerto Rico with a bachelor's degree in education. She has a master's degree in bilingual and English as a second language education from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. She has worked for Beaufort Jasper Hampton Comprehensive Health Services, Inc., the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Health Program in St. Helena Island, Beaufort, South Carolina for the last 14 years as the director of this program. Her duties include coordinating medical, dental, and social services, and she also brings clinical services to the migrant camps where she does outreach activities such as health education and prevention classes on diabetes education, hypertension, and other topics. Mari is a member of the South Carolina Legal Services Board of Directors where she serves as secretary. Before joining BJHCHS Inc., she was served on the board as the secretary. Before leaving the position, as a Spanish teacher for Beaufort County School System that she held for six years. Mari is the site coordinator for the Leroy Brown Community Health Center in St. Helena. Her responsibilities include coordination and management of the clinic. She recently has received two awards. The first award was in 2017 as the, was the Carolyn Davis Renaissance Award. This was given to her by her peers and the executive staff of her health center in recognition for her contributions to local and national agricultural worker health. Her second award she received was the NAC 2018 Outstanding Migrant Health Center Award, which recognizes Mari and her health center in their achievements and contributions to migrant and seasonal health center work. She recognizes that this great achievement was in part due to her team and the hard work of all her coworkers. Mari, welcome to our panel and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You sound so beautiful when you read that um, um, biography. I am so honored and so excited to be part of this uh, webinar as a panelist. And I say good afternoon from beautiful and sunny San Helena, 
uh, in Beaufort, South Carolina. To give you an idea of, you, of where I am located at, I am north of Savannah, Georgia, about an hour from Beaufort, so we're right on the coast. And I thank you, every one of you, for attending this webinar. Uh, I thank you for all you do, for all the participants, all the members of this um, uh, webinar, because you are the pillars and the foundation of the labor of love. Not every agricultural worker health program is alike, and I respect and value every, every program that works with special populations. I am not an expert. I use my heart and the logistics flow from the love and the passion I feel. Thank, Thank you. you, Mari. So can we move to the next slide and have our first question? I'm going to pose this question to you, Mari, and then I will um, turn to Tammy's answers. What methods do you use to convey health information to your patients? The, the questions are great, and it was very uh, difficult for me to uh, kind of compile the information that I would like to give the participants of this um, webinar. Um, first of all, I, I, I like to um, mention the fact that our community health center is celebrating our 50th anniversary and the CEO, Mr. Ronald Garner and the world directors are always in the front lines looking for ways to improve our services in the community. Thank you to HRSA for uh, granting the money for our program. And I say our program because it's not my program. It takes a village to take care of our patients, our children, young and the, uh, and the elderly. And my, the staff and the team of Beaufort Jasper is unbelievable. Uh, my coworkers provide um, you know, assistance with the programs like the nutrition program, women and infant children, Ryan White, the radiology, behavioral health. Uh, uh, my duties as an outreach coordinator, um, the director title, it's, it's nothing compared to the, to the uh, passion I feel and, and the things I do for our seasonal migrant workers. Um, on some of the activities I do, we offer, um, I coordinate the outreach activities, uh, uh, transportation, services and referrals to medical and dental, and social services. I would like to, most of all, uh, and I'm one of the, the groups that are supporting um, the webinar today, to um, thank you, um, Migrant Clinician Network, the National Center for Farm Worker Health, and the Eastern Shore Health Rural System. Um, it, it takes a village. It, it takes all the resources available to achieve your, um, your, my goals, our goals. The population I serve uh, are migrant and seasonal um, uh, patients. And some of the seasonal, meaning that they have established themselves and their families for more than a year, some have been here um, uh, for 15 to 20 years. Uh, seasonal workers use our services and some have become independent users, meaning that they have achieved a goal. They know the system and they can function on their own, but knowing that I'm right here, right? Uh, the methods I use um, with these um, workers are very, very simple. Logistics and assessment. As soon as I get the information that the crews have arrived, the transportation director, we do offer transportation, go for a visit with brochures, flyers with information about our services. Health literacy begins right then, right there. Uh, I get in touch with the contractors, the crew leaders, and the schedule business at, at nighttime to introduce my medical and dental team. 
In other words, we take the clinic to them. Llevamos la clínica a los campos. We take the clinic to the camps. We do an assessment, very basic. We do ask if they would like to. The first thing that indicates health literacy is if they want to complete their own registration. When they say, no, I would prefer for you to uh, do that for me, that's the first indication. With a smile, with our um, uh, complete dedication, we help them complete this um, um, registration. For privacy, we find an empty room. This is transformed into a mini clinic. The services are in place, dental hygienist, medical. And throughout these uh, encounters, we teach them and we give them information of the services we're doing. Blood pressure screenings and dental screenings. Uh, the flyers and the literature, some are designed by the outreach team. Some are downloaded from the CDC website and the Farm Worker Justice created some comic cartoon books that I have been using since last year because they're great. We try to give them small pieces of information. If a patient needs follow-up, he's asked to come to the clinic during the daytime. Do not forget that our patient, these um, uh, farm workers come to make money to send to their families, to save for when they go back to Chiapas, Oaxaca, Veracruz, San Luis Potosí, some of these uh, places, beautiful places in Mexico. The seasonal workers have learned the system. Right now I'm managing six uh, cases of diabetes that I have very, very control and the case management, so three things logistics with assessment, services offered, and case management. Our um, electronic medical record facilitate the communication between the providers and myself. The providers, the ones that go with me to the camps, they can shoot uh, an email and say, Mari, you have to bring Jose back to the clinic. We need to do labs, their sugars were high. And the, the information we give to them at the camp, it's very simple. We do um, a hands-on activities. The dental hygienist has a model of a denture with a big, large toothbrush, and we teach them how to, to brush their teeth, how to floss. And then they continue this on, and we tell them, well, it takes uh, to sing the birthday song while you brush your teeth. That's how long you have to brush your teeth. That's easy to remember. Feliz cumpleaños a ti, happy birthday to you. So, and we videotape them doing this, of course, with their permission. Wow, that's a great, that's a great tool. Yeah, I mean, social media, and they, they want a copy of their video and they go ahead and send it to their families. The flossing, the flossing, um, it's very important. And health literacy, some of us, you know, our, my generation, and don't forget, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an elderly person, uh, experienced, not old. And uh, I, I have them use the letters of the alphabet, the shape of the letter that they need to use to floss their teeth. So we try to do the health literacy as simple and as, uh, as, as, and as practical as we can. So um, the providers send me a, a message to, in, my, uh, in, my, in my medical um, uh, record and I follow through and then I can respond back to my providers with this was done, such and such as an, uh, an appointment to come back for labs, et cetera, et cetera. And That's question number one. Thank you very much, Mari. 
Tammy says something very similar. She works in a different setting, however. Tammy works in a very busy urban health center in San Francisco where she volunteers for four hours a week. Uh, the population that she sees is quite diverse. 40% are first generation immigrants requiring a translator. She also has worked at Indian Health Services in the Southwest prior to her time in San Francisco. She says that she uses lots of handouts with pictures. She uses um, Spanish versions if they're available and simple charts with universally understandable symbols and picture. Before she provides information, she will ask open-ended questions, asking her patients to describe for her what they know about diabetes so she can gauge their understanding. She's able to then, you know, fill in the gaps with their level of experience with diabetes and their knowledge. Um, so next question, please, next slide. Are there red flags for low health literacy and what do those red flags look like? Um, Tammy says that she, um, does not, she does not see her patients giving feedback and if they tend to digress into other topics and don't show much interest, then she knows that there's something they don't quite understand and she will take a deeper dive into um, those areas where they seem to be lost. Mari, how about you? What, are you? what do you look for for red flags for health? Well, well, let me tell you something. I was very, very, I was very careful trying to answer this question because First of all, Maja Angelo wrote, people might not remember what you did for them, but they will remember how they were treated. And of course, let's not forget that we are not trained to judge anyone. We're here to better their lives and take care of their health problems. But I tell you something, there is a new trend in my, in my, in my area with my farm workers. Uh, I started in 2006, and, and now it's 2020, it's 14 years. Many changes have come about, and we have a new trend uh, of, uh, of farm workers coming to the area uh, since the immigration reform. Uh, the implementation of this reform required the growers to hire workers with I-9 forms meaning that they needed workers with a social security number. The workers are now basically, uh, they're uh, fluctuate between the ages of 19 to 65 years of, of age, males only. One of, the, one of the farms do bring families, uh, and, but that's gonna be really little by little going away, unfortunately, because these families I have known for years, and when the farm workers come to Beaufort in June uh, through July 4th, which is almost five to six weeks, it's like family coming home to see us, right? And um, they come with H2A working visas, and they give them a quote unquote, a status of citizenship, okay? They're citizens and they can even go and get a social security, which they don't because they're here for from four to six to 16 months, right? So um, they can even get insurance through their employer, but believe it or not, they are asked to pay 50 to $60 for this health insurance a week. So they come, the, the alternative to them is to come to our centers. Yay, my center, right? So some of the signals um, are, uh, and, and again, these changes taking places uh, back when I started in 2006, there were no guidelines. And people, the, farm, the workers were crossing the borders, will make it to Texas, then move to Florida, and register in Florida with, with the farm 
that they work for with documentation that, that is not necessarily legal. But again, who, who knows and who are we to, to judge and ask about this? So I did notice during this level between 2006 and 2012, the, the, the level of poverty and education was very low. The behavior at the camps was out of control, drinking, the maintenance, the problems with the law. And, and still, and still my, the team and my services as an outreach worker, we, we did it to the camp and we brought them to the clinic because we opened the clinic from June 1st to July 4th to, and we work at nighttime. We accommodate the time for them to go to work and then if they have any health problems, they want a dental cleaning, they have a toothache, they can come between six o'clock in the afternoon to sometimes to midnight. Wow. Again, this is a, it's a work of love. We, we want them to, to better their lives, to be healthy, so now they come to the clinic and I don't even have to look for them. They come and they, uh, they visit with us. And we have many organizations and groups that uh, facilitate resources like food for them, perishables, bandanas, socks. I mean, they come to the clinic and they get all these services. They deserve it. Don't they? I mean, they do a job that no one wants to do. So when the, the growers uh, took care and control of these crews, and between 2015 to now, the families that are coming, uh, they come from Texas following the crops in Florida, and then they come to South Carolina, Beaufort, uh, they go to Gaffney. Now I understand Gaffney is uh, another peach capital. And uh, they go on to Virginia for four months. Uh, the workers uh, are hired after an interview and they have some sort of uh, schooling, okay? Some of them are up to high school. Some, of e some even have some college education. All right. So, I ask you, how do you encourage these patients to ask questions about their diabetes, particularly if they, you know, due to their limited education or not, have something they don't understand? Right. So we do, we do uh, a, um, the strategy is very simple. Um, they I tried to, to the best of my abilities to earn their trust. And I relate to them my experience as a diabetic, believe it or not. I'm an open book. I, um, I, I develop gestational diabetes. So I myself was overwhelmed in 2018 when I almost had a renal failure and I had you know, to start using insulin Believe it or not, I went home and with my education and all, my helper, my support, I was overwhelmed. So I thought about my farm workers and I, I tell them, this is what's gonna happen. We have uh, some models, we have some books, we have some pictures where I showed them, the, uh, we have a system to a team in which I tell them, listen, the organs are going to start uh, turning off one by one, your eyesight. I mean, we have diabetic patients and farm workers, Hispanics and, and Haitians, because we do have a, a very big Haitian population now coming to South Carolina and going on to Virginia. Their hypertension is the problem. Their the Hispanics have their diabetes problem. It's hard to break lifestyles, habits. You mentioned it in your, in your, um, in your presentation. So I, I basically tell them how their bodies, their organs will turn little by little. 
they are referred, then from there, the system begins. They refer to a nutritionist. This nutritionist is a dietitian and diabetes educator. We teach them about what they need to do and how are they going to do it. And what I have them, my interpreters do, or myself, if I'm the one doing the interview, I have them repeat to me what it was taught to them, okay? Okay, Jose, what did we say in that room tonight? And tell me three important things you have to do. We follow them to the lab work. We do lab uh, work and we do their blood work and then we take them to the pharmacy to collect their medication. You know, in you years past, sorry, have the same um, system. You both um, repeat back and ask the clients to repeat back to you what you just taught them. Correct. But I think that's a really great method of using uh, universal precautions. Um, let me ask you our last prepared question for today. Uh -huh. And Tammy, our last question is what can health care providers and staff do to promote clear communication with their patients. And well, what you already mentioned that Tammy also mentions is to build trust, to create a non-judgmental environment and help the patients feel accepted and not singled out, to sit at the same level and to ask questions about them and encourage them to ask questions back. Tell us your method for creating this um, clear line of communication with help in your with your patients. Yes, it's it's a great question, and again, thank you so much for allowing me to share my experiences with you. Uh, our community health centers providers and staff are so willing and able to help out on every possible way. My providers, my nurses, they love to work the night clinic and to, you know, uh, uh, help our farm workers. They ask questions about their, they come into the room, they make them uh, feel comfortable. They uh, go, uh, hablo un poquito de español. I talk a little bit of Spanish. And you're going to see the smiles and how big their eyes open when the providers say that to them. Boom. The, right there, there is a connection, right? Yeah. So for me, to, to what I like to do is to keep incorporating culturally sensitive practices. Interpretation services are in place at all times, face-to-face, -face, with the Syrah.com, uh, CYRA.com is our online and, and telephone interpretation services. Now they have tablets. I call them r 2 ditos because you roll them over on these um, cards and you can connect and you can see the interpreter right there in the, in the room. We have it for uh, Mesteco, Nepal, uh, uh, the, the different languages, the indigenous languages they use. So if I'm not available to interpret, and my interpreters are very well trained, they, they have to kind of hold their hands and make sure that they understand what the provider is telling them. We have also found out that they go home with the, um, their medication and their glucometers. We teach them how to do them, but they don't follow up when they leave and they move on to the next um, um, state. That's when I enroll them with migrant clinician networks. Everybody that comes through my door to be seen at the clinic will be in, uh, will fill out an, a registration for MCN. And if they leave, let's say the crew leader tells them, get ready, we have to go to Virginia tomorrow. I, have, I took a, a blood work. Their A1C is 15, say. I need to contact this patient right away. I connect with MCN, I have the, the permission to um, release his uh, medical records. 
MCM, track them in Virginia. I have my connections in Virginia with Megan, and they are they go and look for the patient. So case management and follow up is very important. Mari, so, thank you very much. You take such great care of the patients, and we are running close to the end, and we want to give our um, audience an opportunity to ask some questions. We only probably have time for one or two as we need to be wrapping up. Are there any questions from the participants? And this is Albert. I encourage you all to use the Q&A pod, um, but if it's easier, just use a chat window since we're able to see that as well. So whatever's easiest then as City mentioned, we'll take one or two questions and then close up. Well, looks like we're not getting any questions. If anybody wants to take a minute, please ask Mari. She has so much experience working with diabetes and the migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. I myself learned so much today from you, Mari. Oh, and thank you. So impressed of how, such an amazing job you do taking care of your patients. It, it takes it takes a system. It takes system. It takes hard work, and it takes ganas y corazón, one in it and heart. Alexis mentioned something about a success story. I very quickly. I want to mention my success story because Danielle is my star. Danny is a diabetic uh, and he was diagnosed with rectum cancer two years ago. And Danielle has taught me many lessons in life. He's 63 years old. He's from Veracruz. He has a family, sons and daughters. And his diabetes has been a problem because Daniel think that eating tortillas, six, eight tortillas is the way to go. That will give him the energy. So Daniel beat cancer and is beating his diabetes due to the fact that we intervene, we follow up, we do case management, and we care about his health. Thank right. you so much. Thank you, Mari. I, I just want to, one last thing, one of our um, participants thanks you for your cultural sensitivity and your compassion. So thank you very much. Um, I'll turn it over to you now, Albert. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Cindy, Mari, Becca, Ariel, um, Alexis, and all the organizers for this webinar. It's been a pleasure um, compiling the content and the speakers for you all today. Uh, just want to close out with some logistics for those of you who are participating in this series for CME and CNE accreditation. Uh, please complete the post webinar survey that will pop up once you leave the meeting session. Um, you'll be asked to fill out your information and asked to either indicate uh, electronic or hard copy of the certificate. And if you do have questions, you can email our colleague at Migrant Clinicians Network, Martha Alvarado, um, and her email is available here on the screen, and it will also be available in our follow-up email that you'll get um, one day from now, so tomorrow. Um, just want to quickly remind you that we have the third webinar in our series next when, uh, sorry, Tuesday, um, the same time at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. I uh, just want to thank again our speakers and panelists for this wonderful presentation and panel discussion. Uh, it's been very informative and want to note that um, again, we look for all your feedback to inform the content for future learning series. Mm -hmm. um, so you can register at diabetes.afsha.org and also catch the recording and slides um, from the past two sessions as well. Uh, next week is another set of National Cooperative Agreement faculty from MHP Salud, National Center for Farm Worker Health, and the National Center for Health and Public Housing so they'll be talking more about health literacy and some effective delivery approaches to address health literacy as a way to carry this conversation today forward. And if you want to contact our NCA faculty, uh, please refer to their email address on this last slide. Uh, and then 
it's also available on our diabetes.apps.org in case you don't have that information um, right now. So greatly appreciate everyone for your time. I know an hour and a half could be lengthy, but really think this has been an informative discussion on health literacy. I hope you all remember the five strategies that Ariel and Becca mentioned. Communicate clearly, use plain language, check for understanding, use positive messaging, and lastly, set goals for self-management, which Mari so eloquently um, gave from her lived experience. So thank you all again, and please keep in touch. Thank you all. You guys are awesome. <laughs> you too, Mari, and thank you all.